Your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to the line of fire. It's it's always fascinating, friends, to step back and look at the universe that God has created. To step back and learn about the creator because of the creation. Do you remember as a kid going to a planetarium? Maybe you've done that, and you'd sit down and, and the ceiling would, would turn into you know the, the universe. You'd look out, you'd see the galaxies, and wow, amazing. There's always this fascination we have and some years back, Nancy and I were watching as many videos as we could talking about the universe, the vastness of the subject, and, and you know, trying to get a handle on the size of it. But of course, the brain breaks down. It just it, it doesn't work. It's too big. It's, it's too magnificent. It's too beyond us. So I love to have the opportunity to talk to my colleague, Dr. Hugh Ross, founder and president of Reasons to Believe. He is an astronomer. And he is a committed follower of Jesus. So he brings together those two wonderful qualities of having scientific understanding of the universe as much as we can as finite human beings, and yet believing in and personally worshiping and following the God who made the universe. And he has a brand new book out, The Creator and the Cosmos, how one astronomer's investigations into both the cosmos and the Bible revealed him a more wondrous personal God than he could have ever imagined. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Ross, great to have you back with us on the line of fire. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, why did you write this book of the many books you've written so far? What is it that prompted you to write this book, which seems almost like a summary of your life journey up to now? Well, it's actually a fourth edition. I came up with a first edition 25 years ago. And the reason I keep bringing up new editions is to demonstrate the biblical principle you see in Job and Psalms, that the more you study the record of nature, the more evidence you'll find for the supernatural handiwork of God. And this fourth edition, I've got 80 new pages of content, because in the last several years, there's been an explosion of new discoveries in astronomy and physics that more strongly established the Christian faith and the reliability of the Bible statements about the universe. Now, as one who works in this field regularly, you don't just do Christian ministry, you and your team, Reasons to Believe, stay up to date with what's happening in scientific literature. Would you say that it's become increasingly difficult to deny a creator of the universe with the more scientific evidence that we have? Yes, that's mainly one of the reasons I brought this edition out is to make the point that my peers who are not uh, believers are now appealing to non-empirical arguments to defend their atheistic worldview. The reason is that the empirical evidence is now overwhelming that there must be God, the God of the Bible, that's behind creating and designing the universe for our benefit. So they're appealing to things we can't measure or test and say maybe in the regions of ignorance there might be something weird going on that allows us to overturn everything we know and understand about the universe. You know, it's interesting. We posted something on our Ask Dr. Brown Facebook page about God the Creator. And someone who is a rocket scientist and an atheist, very friendly, in Australia, responded with, imagine this, and went into a whole multiverse argument, in multiple universes, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I sent the quote to a friend of mine, a medical doctor, whose post I had put on the Facebook page that prompted this response. And he immediately said, notice the opening word, imagine. And so that's what you're saying, that to just look at scientific facts, which is what scientists are supposed to do, because the facts point to a creator, they're now having to speculate beyond the facts. Well, this is the whole point. We know what's true, not because we've got absolute proof. We humans will never have absolute proof for anything. But we know something is securely true if we see that the more we learn about the subject, the stronger becomes the evidence that, in fact, it is true. 
And when that happens at a rate of a, a factor of a thousand times per month, then you can be assured that it is true. And that's what's happening with the fine-tuning design evidence. It's literally increasing uh, for the universe, our galaxy, and our planet Earth to make possible existence. It's increasing at a rate of about a factor of a thousand times per month, mm. which is why I share with skeptics, if you're not persuaded today, wait one month <laughs> and see which way the evidence goes. Uh, now, is this the kind of thing that is trickling its way down into universities, into college campuses, into textbooks that kids are using in school, or is there a, an, an absolute resistance to acknowledge these things? It is trickling down to the graduate uh, physics and astronomy level, but it hasn't trickled down farther than that. It's going to take a while before it gets down to undergraduate science and out to the lay public. I mean, that's one reason I brought the book out, as I said, more than physicists and astronomers need to know about this stuff. This is something the general public needs to be aware of so they can deal with a lot of these atheist challenges that are being bandied about out there. Mm. You know, and I appreciate there, there are other books of yours that you've brought up to date or supplemented. And I remember looking at, at one of them about days of creation. I thought, I have this book. And then I looked at the one I was sent. I thought, this is a much fatter book. Same with Creator and Cosmos, that, that what you've written, you're now building on. It's not that you have to go back and correct things. It's now you have far more evidence to support what you've written. So give us an example. Let's say you're talking to someone that's, that's a serious skeptic. They're not a mocker. They're seriously looking at evidence. They really question a, a personal God and, and how we can really know if there's a creator. So what are some of the most striking or perhaps the most striking single example you could give that you've added to your book, The Creator and the Cosmos? Well, what I document in the book is we've now entered an era of precision cosmology. We're now making measurements to 1% precision or better. <clears throat> And to give an example, the Bible talks about how the universe comes from a space-time beginning, how it continuously expands from that beginning under laws of physics that are held constant, for one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay. So any system that expands under that pervasive law of decay, a.k.a. the second law of thermodynamics, mm -hmm. must get colder and colder as it gets bigger and bigger. And so using these biblical statements, and knowing the age of the universe, we can come up with a biblically predicted cooling curve for the universe. And what's new in the past few years, astronomers have come up with precision measurements of a past temperature state of the universe. They've done that at over 13 different epochs. And what I show you in the book is the biblically predicted cooling curve for the universe over its entire history and overlapping that actual measurements that we astronomers have made and you see that it's a perfect fit between the measurements and what the Bible predicts. And, and when you say the Bible predicts, where would it be predicting this? Well, for example, you see uh, you know, eight places in Isaiah where it speaks about uh, God expanding the universe, also in Jeremiah and Job. Uh, there's 11 places in the Bible where it talks about the space-time beginning of the universe. Uh, Jeremiah 33 declares that uh, God doesn't change, and it's proof that he doesn't change. Look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. If they don't change, he doesn't change. Uh, Ecclesiastes speaks about this pervasive law of decay. Romans chapter 8 explicitly tells us the entire universe has been subject to this pervasive law of decay. Mm. So that's where we can get the Big Bang cosmology. I mean, I tell my friends in astronomy and physics, it's not... Uh, you know, Albert Einstein uh, or George Lemaitre, they came up with the Big Bang model of the universe and actually find it in the pages of the Old Testament that were written more than 2,000 years ago. For thousands of years, the Bible stood as the only book of philosophy, theology, or science that said that we live in a continuously expanding universe. You know, there's the famous story of, of Robert Jastrow in his book, An Astronomer Finds God, and and the picture that's painted is the astronomer climbs to the top of the mountain of knowledge and finds a theologian sitting up there with his Bible. But that's pretty much what you're saying. And that even the idea of the law operate, the universe operating on fixed principles, uh, Einstein said it could, it could be observable and, and that there was mathematical precision to it. 
could it possibly be argued that just over the period of, of billions of years that these laws and principles evolved and that it was just kind of a necessity that things came together like this? Well, it's something we astronomers can directly observe because the farther away we look, the farther back in time we see. And what I document in the book is that we've made observations of quasars and galaxies as far away as 13 billion light years, and we've measured the laws of physics in the spectra that we see from these objects. And those laws of physics measure to be identical to the laws of physics we've measured in the laboratory to 16 places of the decimal. So it demonstrates that that biblical statement, the laws of physics don't change, our measurements show that what the Bible said thousands of years ago is indeed correct. Yeah, ex extraordinary, extraordinary. And uh, Stephen Hawking's brilliant physicist, now deceased, hopefully in his last moments, turned to the Lord only God knows. But Stephen Hawking's had once made a statement for me as a totally non-scientific person, I was baffled by, and John Lennox, a great scientific thinker, took issue with it. And again, for I knew there must be more to it because of Hawking's brilliance, but he basically said that that the universe was created out of nothing, but that the law of gravity somehow existed. I, I couldn't make head or tail of that. How could someone so brilliant make a statement like that? Well, I devote all of chapter 12 in the book to Stephen Hawking's uh, research over his lifetime and the philosophical and theological implications of uh, what he discovered. Matter of fact, we're now giving that chapter away for free. If you go to reasons.org slash cc, uh, you can get that whole chapter for free. And you also see a tribute that I wrote to Stephen Hawking on my Facebook page, because I got to hear him lecture several times when I was at Caltech. Uh, quite an interesting fellow, but yeah, he kept making references to things like gravity creating the universe, or he would say maybe the universe didn't have just one dimension of time, but the equivalent of two dimensions of time. And what I explain in The Creator and the Cosmos of what he was doing is what you see in Romans chapter 1. He was attributing characteristics of God and attaching them to the universe. So, yeah, so he's deifying, yeah, well, I'm going to jump in here. He was deifying the universe, thereby worshiping the creation rather than the Creator. All right, we'll be right back with Dr. E. Ross. We'll make sure you know how to get that chapter free, and then from there, get the rest of the book. We'll be right back. You don't need a PhD to know that our world is in serious trouble. All it takes is one glance at your social media feed to see that we're at a critical time, not just in our nation's history, but in world history. And this generation of believers is facing an unprecedented barrage of attacks against the truth of the gospel. And they're coming from a thousand different directions. If ever there was a time for the body to speak out, to, to raise a righteous standard, and, and to be a beacon of hope in the midst of a sea of despair, now is that time. Through preaching and teaching and radio and writing and social media, God's given us a voice. I mean, by His grace, many, many lives have been impacted for the gospel around the world. So it's for that reason, I wanna take you behind the scenes here and ask Dr. Brown, let you know about some of the exciting projects we're involved in and share with you how you can help us fulfill this great mandate from the Lord in this battle for the hearts and minds of a whole generation. Over the last several months, our studio has undergone a massive overhaul. We have put thousands of dollars into revamping what is basically our command central. This studio is not just used to produce the Line of Fire radio broadcast, but we also produce in this studio hundreds of YouTube videos that you see, as well as our, our media for other ministry outlets like God TV and NRB TV. So this studio is really the heartbeat of, of everything, all the media that we produce at Ask Director Brown. And now we are ready to step into a whole new realm and we can do it with your help. So I'm asking you today to partner with us through your generous donations. We can fulfill this mandate from the Lord in this battle for the hearts and minds of a whole generation. And you can help amplify my voice. Friends, stand with us today. Together, we're making a difference. Here I cry, send the fire. 
It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. All right, I, I just tweeted this out. You want to take advantage of this, the updated edition of Dr. Hugh Ross's classic work, The Creator and the Cosmos, now has a chapter that is devoted entirely to the work of Dr. Stephen Hawking's just deceased. You can get that chapter for free. Go to reasons.org slash cc, reasons.org slash cc. I just tweeted that out. Take advantage of that. And of course, get the whole book for yourself. So Dr. Ross, you were saying before the break that what Stephen Hawking's with all of his brilliance did in his non-belief in a God who created the universe, thereby attributed qualities of deity to the universe itself. Can you unpack that for us? Well, what he mentioned just before he passed was his uh, work years ago with James, James Fardell, uh, where he basically said, Yes, the universe is constrained by time. But let's suppose that in addition to real time, there's imaginary time. And mathematically, that's the equivalent of two distinct dimensions of time. Um, and that's the property that the creator possesses. And what he actually admitted in a brief history of time, all the measurements and observations tell us that the universe and everything in it is constrained to one dimension of time. But he says if there's two dimensions of time, there's no boundary to the universe. And if there's no boundary, what need then do we have for God to create it? Mm. Uh, but the problem is the universe really does have only one dimension of time. And hence, there really is a need uh, for someone to create that dimension of time. And ironically, it was Stephen Hawking along with Roger Penrose that produced the first of the space-time theorems that proved that there must be a beginning to space and time and therefore an agent beyond time that creates time. And as you mentioned that, speaking of the agent beyond time who had to create time, therefore uh, the fact that the universe exists uh, indicates that there is a creator. I mean, there, there's ultimately no way around it when you have the facts and the science in front of you. If, if I'm talking to a non-believer and they have questions about these things. Is your book, The Creator in the Cosmos, something I could give to that person? Would it help them in their journey? Exactly. Of all the books that I've uh, written over the years and decades, The Creator in the Cosmos has brought more people to faith in Jesus Christ than any other and has been through Christians giving the book away to their non-Christian friends. Awesome. All right, friends, again, to get the chapter on Stephen Hawking, go to reasons.org slash cc. You can read that and find out more about the book there. And then explore the website, Reasons to Believe. You'll find different levels of entry. If you're a seeker, if you're a believer with questions, if you're an adult, if you're a child, there's all kinds of material there and new articles being added on a weekly, sometimes daily basis. Dr. Ross, what would you say is the toughest naturalistic objection to God being the creator of the cosmos? What's the most challenging thing that you've had to face, and, and what's your answer to it? Well, typically it's where they say, well, all this fine-tuning design evidence you present presumes the laws of physics. What if we didn't have gravity? What if we didn't have thermodynamics? What if we didn't have electromagnetism? or the strong and weak nuclear force. And one of the space-time dimensions were radically different. And whenever that happens, my response is, oh, you must be talking about the angelic realm. That's a realm of very different laws of physics, different dimensions. But guess what? Their realm is fine-tuned just like our realm is. Simply the complex nature of life demands fine-tuning. Yes, God could have done it differently with different laws of physics, but either way, it's still fine-tuned. And if any of your listeners want to actually see this brought out, there's a debate I did in front of the International Skeptic Society with the atheist particle physicist Victor Stenger, and that was the subject of our debate. They said, yes, if you're talking these laws of physics, then yes, there's no question. It's fine-tuned to make our existence possible. At the very end of the debate, he said, as an atheist, he said, remember, you are all cold nothing. And I thought, wow, that was an honest statement coming from a leading atheist, that if there is no God, 
we humans have no purpose, we have no value, we have no destiny, we're all cold nothing. Yeah, I, I, I don't see any way around that. T to me, we're, we're just neurons firing. Any sense of purpose or destiny is, is the, the figment of our own imagination if, if we are just walking carbon or whatever. Have, have you, in, in, in the aftermath of these debates, ever had interaction with some of these scientists, skeptics, atheists, where they've, they've opened up and ad admitted that the, the evidence is against them or it's, it's more a philosophical thing for them where they just don't want to make the jump? Yes, I mean, that happened after that International Skeptic Society conference. I mean, the audience was composed of 700 atheists from around the world. Wow. And I stayed for more than three hours talking to them uh, individually and in groups afterwards. And... One thing they told me is that it was the first time in their life they'd ever heard a credible scientific defense of the Christian faith. They said, we atheists thought we owned science because you believers are so silent on the science. You talk about everything else except, so we thought we owned it. The second thing they said was, well, in fact, I made an observation to them. I said, you know, I've been here all weekend. I've just found a brand new evidence for my Christian faith. And they said, well, what is that? I said, all of your speakers were focused on the God of the Bible. They let all the other gods get a free skate. The other thing I noticed is how passionate they all were about the non-existence of the God of the Bible. I said, if you really were convinced that the God of the Bible didn't exist, you'd be treating that God like you do the Easter Bunny or the Great Pumpkin or the Tooth Fairy. Your passion tells me you really do believe they exist, but you don't like them. Mm. The response I got from almost every one of them was, it's not that we hate the God of the Bible, but it's that we despise his followers. And then they began to tell me stories of how they had really unpleasant encounters with Christians in their life or people who, thought, who, who they thought were Christians. And so it just showed me, that when you do give solid evidences uh, for your Christian faith, you need to be ready with a compassionate response and listen to people's uh, struggles and hard issues. Yeah, and uh, absolutely. What I found interacting with some atheists is that they're so passionate about justice and so believed in this God that was supposed to be just and fair and, hear, and, and hearing their prayers that when they had a major spiritual disappointment, they just threw everything out. So it wasn't based initially on hostility towards God, but on a sense of, of disappointment. And that, that leads me back to where we started in reading the description of the book. But, but I want to end here. This for you has been over the years writing the book and now updating it with 80 more pages. This for you has been an ongoing discovery of the wonders of the God we serve. So what have you learned for yourself about God over the years, working on this book, now updating it in the fourth edition? Yeah, what I've learned is that uh, literally everything that we see in the universe, every component of the universe, every event in the universe's history plays a critical role in making possible the redemption of billions of us human beings. Mm. That also applies to our galaxy. It applies to our planet. I look up the millions of species of life on planet Earth and realize so in the context of God's goal of redeeming billions of human beings unto himself, each one plays a role. And so the evidence for fine-tuning design really becomes impressive and pervasive when we put it in the context, not just of what God needs to do to make a home for us, but what he needs to do for billions of us to come into a loving, redeemed relationship with him for the rest of eternity. So, so for you, this is not just a matter of scientific evidence for the existence of God, but a revelation into the character of, of God. And this may be a question you can answer for three hours, but we've got about two minutes left. How does this give you a revelation of God being our Heavenly Father? Well, it shows me the degree to which He loves me, the fact that uh, I couldn't be here unless He first created 50 billion trillion stars. I says, wow, if he went to all that effort in order for my existence to be possible, he must care for me a great deal. And realizing that the age of the universe, if the universe were even slightly older or younger, my existence wouldn't be possible. If the stars didn't have the varieties that they did, 
and just looking at the galaxies and realizing there's only one galaxy in which life is possible, realizing that every one of the asteroid belts fulfills a role in making my existence possible. God must care for me a great deal, which gives me the confidence that he's going to be with me and work with me literally every moment of my life, which allows me to kind of step out and basically say, okay, when I walk into that auditorium filled with atheists who are angry, I'm not walking in alone. The creator of the universe is walking into that auditorium with me. And so it gives me the faith and the confidence uh, to be an instrument uh, in those kinds of situations. Incredible. And, and just as you speak, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here drinking this in. It's, it's ministering to me as well and to all of our listeners and viewers. Friends, if you've never visited the website, reasons.org, reasons to believe, reasons.org, check it out today. You'll be enriched. Send your friends there that don't yet believe in the God that we know and love. And then while you're there, go over its reasons.org slash cc forward slash cc go there get the free chapter on dr stephen hawking and then with that i'm sure you'll want to get the whole book the creator and the cosmos dr ross as always it's a delight to speak to you god's blessing on you and the whole team well thank you very much all right friends we come back we're going to change gears and have a very interesting discussion with james robison about working with people that are different than you without getting flaky and sloppy how do you do it What about the Talmud? Is it anti-Christian? Is it filled with attacks on Christians and attacks on Jesus? First, let's understand when we talk about the Talmud, there are two Talmuds, the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. We normally refer to the Babylonian Talmud. That's the more authoritative. That's fuller. That was completed a little over 500 years after the time of Jesus, just to give you context here. Some of the traditions go back to times before Jesus. Most of it is from after the destruction of the Second Temple and then even after the Second Jewish Revolt in the second century of this era. But these traditions were passed on. There are debates, discussions among the rabbis about legal issues, about biblical interpretation, about life. It's this massive compilation. It's it's a lifetime of study to really understand it and master it. If we stack the books of the Talmud up here, they, they'd be this high, okay? So does the Talmud attack Christianity? Is it anti-Christian? For the most part, you just read about Jewish law and discussions among rabbis, and there may be folklore, there may be passing references to things, but it is, it is not polemicizing against other religions or polemicizing against Christianity. However, There are certain sentiments in there that are clearly anti-Christian. Now, we can go back to John's Gospel. John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 41. This accusation was brought against Yeshua. John 8, 41. It it says uh, this, uh, You do the deeds of your father. They said to him, We're not born of fornication. We have one father. We're not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. In other words, you're born of sexual immorality. This idea that Jesus was born out of wedlock, obviously a Jewish response to the claims of the virgin birth, this is found in the Talmud. It is found a few times, these references in Talmud and ancient Jewish literature, derogatory statements about Jesus, or alleging that that he deceived Israel, that he was a sorcerer or things like that. Those comments are there. There are few and far between. For the most part, the attitude of Talmud towards other faiths, if the people are worshiping idols, that's wrong. Uh, Christianity is looked at as a heresy, but the Talmud is not primarily polemicizing against other religions. So does it contain statements you could call anti-Christian? Of course. Is that the heart and soul of it? No, you could you could study for days, for weeks, for months, and never come across anything like that. So to characterize it as anti-Christian can be misleading, although for sure it has some very strong negative statements in there that would point to Jesus or the first disciples. But once more, few and very, very far between.
It's the line of fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Hey, friends. Welcome to the line of fire. Michael Brown, your joyful voice of moral and cultural revolution. Great to be with you today. Hey, go to the stream.org. Stream. Org. I've got a brand new article up there today. Are people born transgender? Trust me, you'll want to know the information that's in there. Also, an article I read with great fascination and interest by Rachel Alexander on stream.org, right on the homepage today, about the Las Vegas massacre, asking very carefully, is there evidence, real evidence, that there is a cover-up? a conspiracy to cover up evidence as to what actually happened. It's it's a pretty unnerving thing to read at stream.org. It's my joy to speak with founder and publisher of the stream, James Robison. And uh, James, it's been a couple of weeks, but great to have you back on with us today. Well, it's good to be with you, Michael. I always enjoy it. I always appreciate what you share. And just thank you for representing God's truth in love. I appreciate it. Well, from the heart, man, we're in this together. All right, so so here's a, a big question, and it goes back to advice that, that Billy Graham gave you many years ago in your own ministry to spend time with the Christians that you were taught to avoid. Now, on the one hand, we know Scripture tells us to avoid false teachers and to mark heretics. At the same time, we know the Scriptures urge us to, to preserve the unity of the body. So, so how do we spend time with believers that we've been taught to avoid and maybe get past some stereotypes and misconceptions without just getting sloppy and thinking anything goes? Well, Paul exhorted in Ephesians 4 that we were to preserve, seek to preserve the unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace, and that's the unity of the Spirit into which we were born, and to tarry like they did in the upper room until they were endued with this power so that they could have the unconditional love for one another, but also an uncompromising spirit. You know, what happens today when we disagree, Doc, it seems like we have a spirit of divorce prevailing even in the lives of believers and Christians. Mm. If we disagree on a point, we just can't seem to come to agreement. We just split. We either start another tribe, another group, or we just get away from it. And I think this is anything but family. There's not a single marriage, there's not a single family member that doesn't have some very serious disagreements, not only tension, not only some foolish arguments sometimes, or even serious ones, but to cut and run, to divorce, is one of the most damaging practices, I believe, in the church and on earth, and we've got to stop that. I, I don't know very many people that I can have a long, lengthy, serious discussion with that we may not find what we consider to be a pretty important or serious point at which we don't see it exactly the same. Now, rather than having a love and a patience that goes with love for one another, to see if we can grow together and at least a, a continuation of that love without having to divorce, to me, is important. I, I am not going to stop loving people just because I am convinced they're wrong or they're convinced I'm wrong. I, it's not like we necessarily, you know, sign a truce, but we just agree to let peace abide. We keep, we preserve the unity of the spirit in a bond of peace. If you and I had a serious, serious disagreement, I don't know a thing you could do, Doc, to stop me from having a very deep, sincere, real, and redemptive love for you. And I would also, though, have this spirit where we disagree. I would ask the Lord to show me if I'm wrong, correct me, and help us reach a point of understanding. Now, that just to me sounds like a very uh, effective way for couples to get along, for family members, brothers and sisters, and people to get along. I read so many things that I think, my goodness, that's not the whole truth. That's just part of the truth. It looks like this person's taking a shot at these other believers. But I don't automatically pick a side. I don't start putting words, names, and labels on that individual to try to discredit them or minimize their effect. I immediately start praying for understanding, praying for an opportunity. You can't believe it. I've got two calls in right now to people that I question some of the things they said, and I don't think they understand exactly what's going on totally that they're addressing uh, in a way that sounds like it's unkind. You know, one of you addressed Michael Gerson recently. 
I've got, I'm trying right now to call him, just talk to him. I just want to talk to him. I, I don't want to say the man is being unjustly critical. He's saying a lot of things that are really, really they, they, they bear meditating on, thinking about. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to decide I'm a person and I'm a this one and we're a part. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do my best to be a peacemaker and preserve the unity of the spirit into which we were born in a bond of Holy Spirit peace. Now, that's where I'm going to live. Yeah, and, and the fact that you pray for the person, sometimes we forget to do Are that. You there? Yeah, and <laughs> that we then pray for ourselves. Maybe we have the blind spot, or, or maybe both of us have blind spots, things that we, we tend to, to not do. Uh, many years ago, there was a brother with a major media ministry who was attacking meetings I was part of the Brownsville Revival. And I was going to be having a debate with him. And I called our student body to pray for him, but in such a way that the prayers were positive prayers. And I would pray the same thing for him that I prayed for myself, that wherever I was doing God's will and speaking his will, that he would give increase. And where I was not doing his will, speaking his will, that he would bring pruning. And after the debate, we ended up having a great time of reconciliation together. He then came and spoke to our student body. When he walked in, he was given a standing ovation, which floored him. But the students never heard a negative word about him. In other words, they prayed for him in a constructive way. They knew he opposed what we were doing, but there was never any hostility in the way we prayed or we're right, he's wrong. It was rather, here's a brother, we're brothers and sisters, Lord, bless your people together. I think sometimes that we have this whole divorce thing, perhaps because of insecurity and our own position. Could that be true? I think what you just illustrated is the perfect illustration of exactly what he was talking about, preserving the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. You did it. It worked. I think we would all be amazed at how effective the gospel would be if we would just practice it, not just preach it, but put it in action. Did you realize, Michael, that if people would be impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ, the transforming power of his truth and his redemptive work in our lives, that we don't have a single issue, a single challenge, a single d d a dilemma that we could not effectively and even successfully address, and we could do it in short order. The solution to the problems in the world are found in the transforming power of the gospel and the impact of that kingdom on every one of us. You just gave an illustration of it. I tried to give an illustration of it, and I'm telling you, this is where I'm going to live. People may want to take all the cheap shots in the world toward me. I'll tell you what, you'll notice something. There are not many people sniping me right now. They're not taking cheap shots at me. You know something? Now, they may start. They may start in mass tomorrow. It could all change, and I'll yep, still yep. love them. I'll forgive them. I'll try to learn from my enemies. That'd be one of the greatest things the president could do is start learning from his enemies, start learning from the people that criticize him. We all need to do that. Love your enemies. They can teach you the truth, not in the best way necessarily, but learn from it. I'm going to do that, period, and, and I'm not going to change. It's interesting that this, this spirit seems to disarm even the harshest critic. Yeah, it, 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 is, it, it is true. You know, uh, on, on one occasion, when I, when I sat down with this, this one brother who was very critical of us, we said, let's spend a few hours together. And my perception had been that he had really been attacking me and coming against us in unfair ways. But when we sat down to talk, the first question I asked him was, how have I failed you in our relationship? And he just wanted me to know that he's a very sincere believer and that there are lots of false attacks against him. And, you know, basically the, the wall between us went down in a matter of seconds. Then there was a lot to talk about and talk through. But it's just like in a husband-wife relationship, once we put down our defenses and once we don't just walk in such pride, and now I'm, I'm concerned about the other person. Normally, once you get there, you've already opened up a massive door of communication. So it comes down to, do I love my neighbor, including the neighbor that I differ with? Well, if all marriages and couples treat each other the way church leaders and church members and preachers treat each other, every marriage would end in divorce. True. So there's something amiss, and I want to be a part of correcting it and inspiring the correction of it. And I'm determined to, to live that out. I'm not, I'm not going to go somewhere else to try to prove to everybody else that I'm right and they're wrong and look how wonderful what I believe is. I'm going to try to show them the transforming power of how wonderful the gospel is so that we can all continue to be soft clay 
yielded in the hands of God, the master potter, to continue to shape Christ in us. And let's keep in mind that even the pressure and attack that comes from the enemy can still shape Christ in us because it's filtered through the fingers of the hand of God. So everything that happens in our life, if we allow God to use it correctly, it will shape Christ in us. And that's the hope of his glory being revealed on this earth. Yeah, uh, I, I remember the first piece of hate mail I got in ministry decades ago. Someone uh, gave it to me at our book table. And this is decades and decades back. And, and I brought it home and I said to Nancy, you're not going to believe what this person said. It's crazy. And I started and I, and I was ready to throw it out. She goes, no, no, no. Maybe there's some truth in it. I said, what are you talking about? The guy's off the deep end. She's going, I know, I know. But maybe there's some truth in it to learn oh, from. That was wisdom, Michael. Yeah. That was wisdom from your wife. Yeah, and, you know, you have to immediately then put the pride down and say, okay, maybe I can, maybe there is something that I could learn from this. And and James, one thing you've done now is really seek to get God's heart and speak to the nation as, as a father, because it's such a fatherless nation and generation. And you're doing that on your Facebook page, Rev. James Robinson. And then those are also posted on stream, stream.org. What's the last thing that you've talked to the nation about, just this Father's Heart perspective? Well, last night I joined Sammy Rodriguez and my pastor, Robert Morris, Gateway Pastor. And Sammy calls me dad, and, and Robert looks at me as a father. And we talked about mentoring and mantles, but we, we focused on, on mentoring. And by the way, this is a one-hour program that will air on TBN on praise very soon. You don't want to miss it. And it'll air several times, maybe many times, because God showed up. It was really, really amazing. And they were asking about the mentoring effect that I'd had on their life and many others that they brought up. Uh, you know, you kindly said that I've had some kind of positive effects on your life. Now, here's the deal. I, I don't go out seeking to mentor people. I go out and love people. And when I love someone, it's the Father's love that's filling my heart to overflowing and out of the abundance of my heart, the Father speaks. And he speaks as a father, as the mentor, as the one that speaks not only perhaps sometimes correction or exhortation, but always encouragement. Mm. And that, that's just, it's just simply a way of life. It's, yeah. it's not who I am. It's who he is in me. And, and you know, it really, it, it does shine through. We, we're out of time, my dear brother. But thank you again for joining us and for exemplifying the message you preach. From the Pacific Justice Institute. I want to present to you a unique way that you can partner together with me to reach Jewish people with the good news of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Hey, Paul wrote that the gospel is to the Jew first, but many of us don't know how to reach the Jewish people with the gospel. Can I tell you, we have a unique open door and Jewish people are ready to hear, but we need your help. When I was in Israel recently, my last hour in Jerusalem, about a dozen different people came up to me and they wanted to thank me for the impact of our message. One Jewish woman came up to me, a believer in Jesus. She said, you saved my son's life. He was falling away. He was getting pulled by other objections to Jesus. He read your material. He's back in the faith. A young man came up to me. He said he and his Orthodox Jewish friends, here he is, I mean, with the, with the yarmulke, the head covering, the traditional Jewish outfit, he said he and his Jewish friends, his Orthodox friends, watch my debates with rabbis. A few years ago, I was able to lead a Holocaust survivor to faith in Jesus. He was a brilliant man, an atheist who had fled the Holocaust. He read my books on answering Jewish objections to Jesus, came to faith, led his wife to the Lord before they left this world. Friends, we have the resources. We have books ready to be translated in Hebrew to be distributed in Israel. We have our Real Messiah website, unique for reaching Jewish people, Orthodox Jews with the gospel, ready to be translated in Hebrew, ready to do internet campaigns to get into every home in Israel. Every cell phone in Israel can have this message, but we need your help. Every gift to our ministry will literally help us reach another Jewish person with the good news of Jesus the Messiah. Go to askdrbrown.org. AskDrBrown.org, and when you go there, we will partner together to bring salvation to Israel and the Jewish people. Together, we're making a great difference.
Now is the time to reach the lost sheep of the House of Israel, to share in this end time harvest of Jewish souls, and to find out how to receive this two D. And is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to the Line of Fire. This is Michael Brown. What a delight talking to my friend and colleague James Robinson. And he, yeah, he really does walk in very supernatural, very deep love. And, and you know, if he's, if he's in your court, he's a friend. So I, I want to talk to you about this for a moment, about walking in love, about being redemptive in the midst of differences we have. So, so look, <clears throat> we have differences with some people who are of another faith or not of any faith. In other words, an atheist or an agnostic or a Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. These are people who are completely outside of our sphere of faith. We don't look at them as fellow believers. We don't expect them to share our same belief system. We understand that. And yet, if that person was our next door neighbor, we'd love that person as ourself. Yes, that would be our calling. And we'd reach out to them. We'd be kind to them. We'd do what we could to be good neighbors and thereby demonstrate the reality of our faith in God through our love for them and be genuinely good human beings so that they would be glad that we are their neighbors, right? That, that would be the goal. Now, ultimately, they may be uncomfortable because we're believers and they're not, but our heart is we love them. We, we are not going to have fellowship with them in terms of a deep spiritual bond. That's not going to happen, right? But we can certainly be co-workers, friends, neighbors, and, and, and we should exemplify the spirit of Jesus in that. What about people who claim to be followers of Jesus, but are heretical in their beliefs, like Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or other groups like that? Well, again, we treat them in a similar way. We treat them as people outside of the faith we treat them as we would treat any other person who doesn't know the Lord, loving them as ourselves, seeking to be good neighbors, friends, co-workers, but we couldn't have fellowship with them, nor could we work together for the gospel. Now, let's say there was a crisis in our neighborhood and something happened whereby everybody had to chip in together to try to help out a family that was destitute or some natural disaster hit, you know, there's an earthquake and people buried under rubble. Well, we all go running down together, atheist, Hindu, Buddhist, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, born again, Christian, side by side, and try to pull the rubble off people, right? But if there was a prayer meeting that night, praying for victims that are in the hospital, I'm not gonna be part of a joint prayer meeting where everyone's praying to their God or whatever. I'm gonna pray with other believers. So my spiritual activities are going to be together with other believers and natural things we can work together on, you know, your food distribution. Okay. How can we work together as a neighborhood to help out those that are in need? Great. Everybody working together, but ultimately gospel solutions are only going to be found with fellow believers. Okay. What about people of, of whose faith we're not sure in other words, they seem to be believers. They seem to be genuine. They seem to profess that they've come to faith in the God of the Bible, etc. But some of their beliefs are very different than ours. Why not get to know them? <laughs> okay, pretty radical, extreme idea. Why not spend time together and find out what they really believe? I just got a copy yesterday of my book, The Grace Controversy, which came out after Hypergrace at the request of the publisher. It's shorter. It's a popular version. It breaks things down into certain questions. It does not take the place of Hypergrace. It's kind of just a, a different book on the same subject. Just got a copy of it translated into Indonesian. So Hypergrace has been translated into many languages. It's been translated into Finnish and into Italian and into German and into Dutch and into Indonesian, etc. And now Grace Controversy, also in Indonesian. I'm not sure if it's in other languages. Well, I have very, very, very strong differences with Hypergrace teachers. Some of them call themselves Hypergrace teachers. Some of them, this is how I categorize them based on them holding to certain fundamental beliefs. And uh, because of that, I spent over two hours with Pastor Joseph Prince oh, 15 months ago when I was in Singapore. 
Pastor Prince is the best known teacher worldwide that I would say teaches a message of hyper grace. He wanted me to know areas that he emphasized that I would know were absolutely foundational to me. In other words, his, his faith in the word of God, his love for the word of God, his love to win the loss to Jesus, his belief that submission to the Lord Jesus is important and essential, his belief that holiness is progressive, that you cannot get more righteous because you're declared righteous at salvation, but you can get more holy. You can become holier as you grow in the Lord, which many of those who hold to hyper grace do not believe that they say that holiness is instantaneous just as righteousness is. In any case, we worked together. I wrote an article and then I sent it to him and we went back and forth on the wording saying these are the areas where we agree. We still have differences. We still have areas of disagreement. Absolutely. I'm glad that my Hyper Grace book continues to get out, make an impact, be translated. I'm glad the Grace Controversy is out in Hyper Grace. I quote Joseph Prince many times, but you'll see in the book, I quote him as a brother. You say, why? Because according to everything I understand, he is genuinely born again. He holds to gospel fundamentals. He wants to see people truly saved and discipled. And the differences that we have are differences within the faith. There is nothing of the fundamental gospel to my knowledge that he denies. And there are areas within the gospel, within salvation, where we have strong differences. But in the book, I quote him as a brother. And I also reference testimonies of people whom I've heard from regularly through the years now, who have been positively transformed by the message of grace that he preaches. I've met them regularly. Uh, people that I've known for years said that they were really bogged down and struggling. Lord, people that graduated from ministry school and served on the mission field. One, one of them said, yeah, just they didn't agree with everything he said. Maybe 20%, 30% they differed with, but the 70 or 80% was liberating and life-changing for them has really helped them in their walk with the Lord. Somebody tweeted me one day, I'm not sure if I should get your book, Hyper Grace. I got set free from alcoholism listening to Joseph Prince. I said, well, you'll be helped by the book. We'll only build on the grace truths and remove some error along the way. Uh, Pastor Prince sent me many, many testimonies of people delivered from all kinds of sexual immorality uh, as a result of hearing his message. In other words, he says that the message he preached leads to holiness. And I said, yeah, there's error in it that's going to confuse people as well. But here's the point. We can emphasize where we agree. Now, I've had people damning me to hell because I recognize him as a brother. So be it. That, fine. Go, go ahead. I'm not his defender. I'm not his apologist. We differ. I wrote the book, Hyper Grace. Okay. We differ. That being said, spending time together really helped me better understand what he believed, helped me probe some issues with him, help us focus specifically on areas where we still differ with each other. My hope is that whenever he preaches and teaches that some of my differences with him would be in his, his head. Cause I said, man, if you could just preach repentance more clearly and lay these things out more clearly, it would be helpful. You know, and whatever perspective he has, what he does in his ministries between him and God. But here's the point. We spent time together here. We might've spent all that time and concluded that our differences were even deeper. Well then good. It's good. We spent the time together. Then I shout out my warnings even more loudly than before. And then he tells people to avoid my book, you know, whatever. Or we find there are areas of common concern that we have with exaggerations of grace. He said to me, why don't we agree to expose counterfeit grace? And he laid out what he meant by counterfeit grace. I said, I agree with that definition of counterfeit grace. Yeah, let's put our strengths together because by God's grace, we both have influence and platforms. Let's put our strengths together. He has a massive, massive TV platform these days. And let's come against counterfeit grace. Well, at the same time, people realize we have differences about other issues within the faith. I want to encourage you, if you're a pastor or leader, have you gotten together with other pastors and leaders in your city? I'm not talking about those who are in cults, you're trying to reach out to them, but those who are within the body. Now, maybe it's a liberal Lutheran Presbyterian pastor. When you get with this guy or gal, you'll find out they don't even believe in the authority of scripture. They don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. Okay. That's so now you're, you deal with them like an unsafe person. You're trying to reach. All right. 
But I'm talking about your Baptist and you got an Assembly of God pastor. You're, you're Presbyterian, there's a Baptist pastor. You're, you, whatever the different groups are that claim to believe in the Bible as God's word, not exterior books as God's word, like the Mormons do and things like that, that hold to the fundamentals of you know, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, you know, the fundamentals, whatever. Okay, the basics, they affirm those things. Have you ever spent time together? Have you ever done it? Or just brothers and sisters? You got friends and, and other churches. And rather than arguing all the time, oh, you're wrong on it. Have, have you ever spent time together and talked things through and found out maybe you have more in common than you realize? Or maybe you could each learn from each other because maybe you each have strengths. Could it be? Let me encourage you to think about it. All right, friends. That being said, let me encourage you to visit our GoFundMe page. We now have an updated video showing you progress. You got to see it. You got to see what I see in the studio. We take you around the screens, the whole setup, the, everything that's happened through your contributions. And this is how we're doing live stream right now on YouTube and Facebook. That as you're listening on radio, others are watching me live on YouTube and Facebook. So go to, excuse me, go fundme.com forward slash ask dr brown studio go fundme.com forward slash askdr brown studio together we're making a difference back with you tomorrow